This is Support is Sexy, episode 144, with Jen Glantz, CEO of Bridesmaid for Hire and author of Always a Bridesmaid for Hire. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I interview inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and their lessons to help you take your business and your life to the next level and create something sexy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. Thank you so much for being here because it would not be the same without you. And today I am so excited. This is such a fun episode. We are talking to Miss Jen Glantz. And Jen is the founder and CEO of a very unconventional but smart, at least I think, business called Bridesmaid for Hire. And she's going to tell you all about how she came up with that idea, how she put the idea out there and moved on it quickly. Take inspired action. That's what it's all about. Jen is also the author of the upcoming book, Always a Bridesmaid for a Hire, that is based on her experience of launching this business, a little bit of her dating life. She just pulls it all together in this wonderful package. And that's some of the things that I ask her about packaging your brand or your business or and really how you offer that or pitch that to media because Jen has been featured Let me just say first, her company launched in 2014 and already she has worked with more than 50 brides and she's been featured in more than 500 media outlets. That's from television to magazines to websites and much more. To me, that is insane, insanely good, but insane, especially as a person coming from media and know what it sometimes takes. I actually think it might be even more difficult to get in front of media because we're all so infiltrated with so many pitches and ideas and information. But Jen has been masterful, really, at doing that and making sure people know about this great business that she created. So we talk a little bit about that and you'll get a lot of tips from her on how she made that happen. But in this episode, you'll also learn from Jen how to move beyond the bullies in your life, how to be okay with being, quote unquote, the weird one, how to use rejection to catapult you forward, why you should wait to tell your friends about your crazy idea. I'm all for that. I share a lot with my friends, but sometimes you just got to work it out in your mind first. Also, smart ways to test your idea with customers, her tips for securing major media coverage for your business or brand, how to stay committed to your business in the face of doubters. And some of the doubters, at least that I observe and looking at Jen's work and what she's done, were people interviewing her on television. So as I said, she was great at getting that coverage. And I also think she was great at handling people who didn't understand her vision. Jen also talks about why there are many no's to get to that yes, why it's important to fail and why she tries to attempt something that she might fail at regularly, why you have to have people in your support network who are very different from you, how to learn how to negotiate on your own behalf, Why you have to put down the business books and stop reading the blog posts and get out there. And finally, the power of doing it afraid. So I know you're going to love Jen. Her energy is fantastic. This is a really great episode. Tons of great information. You know, you can go to supportissexypodcast.com to see all of the resources she mentioned. Find out how to follow Jen. Find out how to pre-order her book for 40% off, which is a great offer. It's coming out on February 7th. So if you're listening to this in real time, be sure to go to support is sexy podcast.com so you can get that link to order the book but for now without further ado jen glance so jen thank you so much for joining us for an episode of support is sexy i'm excited to have you here thank you so much for having me on the podcast today absolutely so first question when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship I think that I always had a something inside of me that was telling me I needed to do more. I wanted to do something for myself. And my first moment of realizing that I wanted to be an entrepreneur was when I was in the second grade. Uh, I was having a sleepover with my friend Jamie and I woke up at seven o'clock in the morning and said, Jamie, I want to sell something today. I want us to create our own thing, our own business and sell something. And she was like, Jen, go back to sleep. You know, what are you even talking about? But 
I just had this feeling at that young age to do something, you know, crazy. And I gathered up all of the comic books in her house and I made a stand outside on her neighborhood block and I sold comic books. And that was my first taste at how it felt to be in front of people, sell something and kind of start my own tiny little mini business. And I loved the feeling of it. What do you think it was that sort of drew you to that or that idea? Had you seen that somewhere else or was it just something that was in you? I think it was a little bit of something in me. Uh, I was really bored by usual childhood activities. I would take my Barbies that I had and I would really create these really intricate stories and adventures with them. And, you know, my mind was always running in circles of how I could do more and how I could create. And I think at that age, I just wanted to try as many weird, crazy things as possible, even if that included selling comic books and trying to get my friend Jamie to come along with me and try it out. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Boca Raton, Florida, which is uh, frequently known where people's grandparents live. So um, it's a town with a lot of older people for sure. And I definitely was very close to my family. And my family always encouraged me to follow my dreams, which I think made everything so much easier when I wanted to be an entrepreneur and when I wanted to start my own business. What was a young Jen like growing up in Boca Raton? I was always the odd one out. Um, You know, it's sad to say, but I was bullied a little bit in school. I went to a private school for many years, and I was always very different than everybody else. I was super shy, but I also had this thing about me where I just wanted to do and wear whatever I wanted. I never followed, you know, social constraints or norms, and uh, I I wore a sparkly belt to school and different colored converse, and I always was just the the weird one, Um, and I I always followed my own heart, and I didn't quite fit in, which back then is is a really terrifying thing for a child to to feel like, but now it's the coolest feeling in the world to be like that. Right. You know, you realize that you're special or that everybody's special and different. Yeah, and, and not only that, but it's okay to be like that, and it's okay to accept people around you who are like that. And, um, you know, I look back at that time in my life, and I just remember girls being so not supportive and not there for me. And uh, and now I look at my life now, and, you know, my support system now is made up of so many incredible female entrepreneurs or females in general who are rooting me on. And, you know, I think as we grow up, we, we really change how we treat other people, and it's fascinating. How did you get through it um, at that time being, you know, as you said, you can look back on it now, but as you, when you were a young girl, how did you get through those moments where you sort of felt like you were a misfit or people were not treating you as well as they should have? I think it was really hard back then. You know, I imagined that I was very sad and I I talked to my mom about it and uh, I turned to doing my own thing. So I read a ton of books. I became this avid reader. I would go to the library a lot and books became, you know, a source of being my best friend in a way. And I started playing sports and that's where I really learned how to work on a team. And I made great friends through that. And uh, I, I think as I got older, I ignored all of the, you know, negativity coming my way and instead just kept following my heart. And I think going through that at a young age for anyone who was bullied a little bit in school and a lot of young women were, uh, I think it makes you, you know, the kind of person as you grow up who just becomes stronger and knows how to defend themselves and stand up for themselves. And, um, you know, it's a blessing in disguise in a way because it really sets you up on this path of being able to fight back when you know you're not getting what you deserve. How to fight back and do you think also how to move beyond rejection? Definitely. And I think that that's one thing we all face constantly in our lives. It's just human nature to be rejected, whether it's from a job, a relationship, a project you're working on. And rejection never, ever, ever gets easier. No matter who you are, how many times it slaps you in the face, it's still really hard. And uh, I've been rejected, you know, more times than I've had success. But I look at it in a very odd way as being something that catapults me to success. Every time I'm rejected, I look at that situation and say, awesome. You know, this person knows I exist. They didn't think I was good enough today, but that doesn't mean in a week, a year, a couple years, they won't want me. Mm -hmm. Who were some of your greatest influences growing up? I would say that they were my, you know, family members. I had an older brother who was four years older than me. And, you know, as this little girl, I thought he was the coolest person in the entire world. He had a major influence on me. Uh, He was a very strong person. And he um, was also somebody that was able to um, be nice to everybody around them. And I really looked up to him and everything he was doing. And I was heavily influenced by my mom. She wouldn't let me give up when I was rejected. I I remember when I was 14 years old, I applied to write. I always wanted to be a writer, and I applied to write for my high school newspaper. And the teacher at the time sat me down and said, 
he wasn't going to let me write for the newspaper and that I wasn't a good enough writer. Mm. And I went home to my mom and I was like, Mom, I'm going to give up on writing. And she said to me, um, you know, you can't listen to people when they reject you. You have to find other ways. And she was the one who never allowed me to give up ever on anything that I really wanted. And until this day, that stands true. What kind of work did you think you were going to do after high school and when you went on? Did you have an idea of what kind of career, I should say, that you wanted to go into? It was tricky because I knew I loved writing. So I majored in poetry and journalism and I knew I loved writing, but writing was never enough. I always wanted to have a job where I was around people. I was helping people, managing people. Um, And, you know, it was unfortunate in college when you're a writing major they really steer you toward very specific paths. There was no talk of, oh, you can start your own business or you can do Mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z. Um, So I didn't even know all of the possibilities I could go on to do. I think at that early age, I thought, okay, you know, maybe I'll, um, you know, write something. I, I didn't know what, but I never knew that I could fuse together two of my passions or many of my passions and create something for myself. So let's talk about what you created then, Bridesmaid for Hire, which is, I just think, brilliant. And we'll talk more about that. But how did you, um, how did that become a thing for you? Tell us about that story. I was a bridesmaid so many times for my friends in my early 20s. All my friends got engaged and I was always the bridesmaid. And, um, you know, when I was behind the scenes at weddings, I noticed that there was nobody there whose job it was to be there for the bride. If she had a wedding planner, that person was so busy setting up the the wedding, working with the vendors. Uh, If she had bridesmaids, they were busy getting ready, making sure their hair looked good and hanging out. There was nobody running around for the bride and making sure that she had everything she needed, including just somebody to vent to. Uh, So I decided to do this for strangers. I figured, why not? I'm sure there are people out there who don't have close friends or who might have close friends, but they're busy or they live far away or they're just not super supportive in the way that person needs. Uh, So in 2014, I had no business experience. I mentioned I'm a poetry major. I went to craigslist.com, posted an ad there offering my services as a bridesmaid, which was ridiculous and crazy, uh, but it worked. And I got a couple hundred responses from brides all around the world who were interested in hiring me and and having me at their wedding. At what point did you feel, though, that, okay, this is a business or this could be a business? I think it really hit me when I worked my first wedding. Mm -hmm. I worked a wedding in Minnesota. And when I was there, I uh, was there for a bride who had fired her maid of honor because that person was not supporting her at all. And she desperately needed, you know, a female support system. And when I was there, uh, I remember just all of the things I was able to do for her. And I was really able to flip her whole wedding and make it something that she might not have had if I wasn't there. I realized to myself that this is a business. There's something here and I want to run far away with it and really pursue it. And you got a lot of responses when you first posted that that ad on Craigslist, right? It was sort of seems like it was a test. So you were going to see how it goes. And then didn't you get over 100 responses? I did. It was my weird way of testing out a weird idea. You know, if I mm-hmm. would have told any of my friends and family, this is what I want to do. I want to be a hired bridesmaid. You know, I'm certain they would say, Jen, you're crazy. You know, do something else. Uh, so I had no place to really truly test the idea. And I figured Craigslist is a place where everything flies. There's so many things mm-hmm. on there. Why not try my business out in a world like that? And after I posted the ad, I had a lot of emails from people telling me they needed something like this or they needed something that wasn't offered in the wedding industry. And I decided to create a business around those needs. Do you think that's something that you would suggest for other people who are thinking of um, maybe unconventional ideas or something or a new spin of an idea that already exists to find a way that's inexpensive, not too risky, but you don't have to tell all of your friends about it. I think that's an important point that you said, sort of test it first with people who would be your customer and see how it might get a response. Definitely. And I think sometimes when we have these crazy ideas, one thing we shouldn't do is necessarily share them with everybody. Maybe right. tell a couple people in your network and your support system your idea. But if you tell too many people before you've tried it out and tested your idea, they may talk you out of it. And I'm certain that would have happened to me. So yeah, I definitely recommend people who have this burning idea in their head, something unique and different to go ahead and try it out and, and maybe perhaps give it to three people to try. Or, or if you have a service, you know, give it away for free for three people to test the audience and see how it really is going to work. 
I think that's a great idea. Test the audience, give it to people, and then uh, one of the things that I'm actually doing right now, then tell them one of the, the quote-unquote payments would be a survey that they would have to answer at the end so you get some kind of really structured feedback. Definitely. And that's why I also recommend the people you give the service to, to try out or the product to, to try out for free, um, that they're people you don't know. Mm -hmm. They're people who are complete strangers and perhaps they don't even know that you're the person who started the business. Sometimes they won't be as honest if they know that it's yours. And I always tell people, you know, find these three people, say you're reaching out on behalf of this business for them to test it. And that way you'll be able to get really valuable feedback. Now, when you started Bridesmaid for Hire, were you working full time? You were. I was. Yeah, I was working full time as a copywriter at a tech startup and trying to figure out this business on the side. Have you transitioned now to focusing full time on the business? It's been a couple of years or do you do or several other projects as well? Yeah, so I um, I was actually laid off from my full time job in 2015. So that gave me the fuel and the fire to pursue That's a this. blessing. Yeah, it was definitely a blessing. And, um, you know, I like to be completely honest about it that mm -hmm. I have multiple projects happening every month to supplement my income. And I think as an entrepreneur, sometimes we're so focused on just making one thing work and one thing only. But we have to be realistic. We have bills to pay. We have a life to live. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in my world, I live in New York City. It's very expensive. So I have about, you know, 10 to 15 different sources of income every month uh, just to be able to afford living and um, also running a business. How do you do all of those? How do you juggle, I should say, all of those different things? Is it just being a master at planning, which is part of what you're doing, master at planning and being able to manage your time? Definitely. And I think it's creating a system that you're organized with yourself. So if you looked at my organization, you might be like, this makes completely no sense. But to me, it does. So mm -hmm. I think having some kind of personal organizational system, whether it's a spreadsheet or notes that you leave of what you're going to do every day. Um, what I personally like to do is before I go to sleep every night or in the morning, I wake up and I make my list of tasks for that day. And that's my list. And if I really need to stay focused, I give myself time constraints. So I say, okay, task one, I have to do that between nine and 11. At 11, I have to jump to something else. So organizing yourself like that or however works for you and your style um, is really the only way to be able to juggle multiple things without multitasking and, and really just giving you know half of yourself to each project. Right. Now with bride, Bridesmaid for Hire, I'm sure this is a common question that you get. Why would someone hire Bridesmaids for Hire rather than a wedding planner or depend on a maid of honor? That's such a great question. So oftentimes they have wedding planners when they hire me because the wedding planner's job is to plan the wedding. They mm -hmm. help with making sure all the pieces come together, the room set up perfectly, your vendors are on time. Um, I don't do any of that. And the, the maid of honor that you might have might be wonderful, but being a maid of honor can feel like a full-time job. So oftentimes they hire me to take on a lot of those roles so that the maid of honor doesn't have to feel stressed out or she doesn't have to feel like she's working overtime to get everything done. Um, I always say I do the dirty work so that you and your friends could really just have the best wedding experience possible. Now you've worked more than 50 weddings at this point, right? Yes, I've worked with over 50 clients. Is there one common need that you've seen from all of your brides or all of the weddings that you or most of the weddings that you've done? Definitely. I would say that's a person to vent to. Uh, you know, oftentimes your friends, that's what they're there for. You call them up, you vent, they support you. But sometimes you need a wedding professional who you can call up, tell all your problems to. They won't judge you and they'll give you honest advice. And I think providing that kind of service to brides out there, even bridesmaids out there, uh, they feel like they have a safe place to just admit what's going through their head and getting feedback in a way that, you know, their friend's not rushing you off the phone because they want to watch TV or because, mm -hmm. frankly, they don't know what's going on. They never been married themselves or, or planned a wedding. So um, that's been the number one thing I think brides fi really find valuable. Now, you've appeared on, I mean, so many networks and, and shows, Fox, CNN, Bravo, Today Show, and a long list of others and within other outlets talking about your business. From a strategy standpoint, how did you go about spreading the word and securing media for yourself? It takes a lot of determination. Um, I think what happens is when we reach out to people, whether it's for PR purposes, partnership purposes, or sales purposes, we do one reach out, we let it 
we let it sit there and then we hope they respond. Um, I am extremely determined when it comes to reaching out to people, whether that means following up with multiple emails, getting on the phone with them, um, and also being catchy with what you write them. You know, we all receive hundreds or, or a lot of emails a day. Some of us receive more emails than we could read in a day. Um, so the trick is to really be short, concise, and fun in your email. And, um, you know, a lot of what my secret to success was, was just reaching out multiple times and writing emails that, that caught their attention attention. Excellent. Have you ever used um, Rebump as a follow up tool? No, what's that? Do you personally follow up in your emails? Or how do you what tools do you use? I'm just curious. I personally, I do. I personally do. And it takes so long. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'll send you a link. But for everyone listening, and this is no affiliate or anything, but Rebump is something I think I heard about on another podcast. I think it's rebump.cc. But if you Google it, you'll see it. And you can set up a series of follow up emails that you can personalize to the person and you can do it, you know, whether it's one week later, two weeks later, etc. It'll say, hey, Jen, just making sure that you got this email and then your previous email will be below. And you can make it incredible. It's I'm going to send it to you because I'm sure you could use it. It's fantastic. I love it. I love it already. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And then it'll show you, you can go into the analytics and you can see, you know, who opened it, how they, res- if they responded, you know, it'll stop once the person responds. But I've gotten emails back from people that I've even forgotten that I emailed, you know, it's like, oh, great. Because no, all of us get so many emails. It's not that people are necessarily even ignoring you. Sometimes they don't see it till the second time or they meant to get back and then it got drowned and all these others. So anyway, not to go too much into that, but I think that'll help. I love it. That's seriously so great to hear that there's a service like that out there. It's fantastic. I'll send it to you. So anyway, more about you. What would you say your advice um, advice you have then for businesses who are looking to new businesses, really, who are looking to secure media? What should be their first step? I think the first step is to figure out what your story is and realizing that you having a business or you starting a business is not the core of your story. You know, your story is what really makes you shine, what makes you different, what makes you unique. And I would totally lead with that. Excellent. Now, I've watched several of your interviews, as we mentioned, with major media outlets. And one thing that I notice is many of the hosts seem almost incredulous about this idea of bridesmaids for hire. They're, oh, why don't these people have friends? Or, you know, we all make our judgments or or our opinions based on our own perspectives. And you always handle it so well, I have to tell you that. But how do you... Yeah, of course. How do you stay committed to your vision during moments like that in general, whether certainly if it's on live TV, but in general? I think when you love something to its core, you're willing to fight for it. You're willing to defend it. And I knew from the start that this was an idea that would make people shake their heads at me. And because of that, because I believed in it, I knew that I would have to fight for it more than a traditional type of business. And, you know, since the start, I've had critics. I've had acquaintances of mine email me, call me or see me in person and say, what are you doing with your life, Jen? This is so stupid. And I would look at them and it would almost come out naturally to be like, at least I'm doing something for myself, you Mm -hmm. know, and and I'm proud of that. And let me be the judge if if it works or not, or if it's stupid. And I think because I truly believed in what I was doing, and I saw firsthand how it was changing people's lives, that when I was faced with critics or people who were just like, what the heck is this, that my defense was just showing them and telling them about these stories, about the success I've had influencing people's lives. And I think when people come to us with criticism, it's fear because they don't understand fully what we're doing or why we're doing it. So we have to look at that as just a way of informing them and telling them what they don't understand. Excellent. Now, do you see your business as something that can expand? And if so, what is your vision for that expansion and growth? I sure hope so. You know, I've been really lucky to say that since I started uh, two years ago, I've had over 15,000 women apply to work for me, which is an crazy, crazy number. And of course, I can't hire all of them, but I have hired some to work weddings for me and with me. And um, in the future, I plan to train women how to start their own business and help them with support tools and access to, you know, me just to help them get off the ground and do something wonderful for themselves. Because I've really seen firsthand how having your own business could really just transform transform your entire life. Excellent. Now tell us about your upcoming book, Always a Bridesmaid for Hire. Yeah, so I decided uh, last year to sit down and write down some of these incredible stories I've had and how the strangers I've worked with have really changed and impacted my life. So I wrote the book, Always a Bridesmaid for Hire. It comes out February 7th and inside are stories about, you know, my personal life growing up, uh, finding love for myself, which has been really hard and um, working weddings for strangers. Um, 
you know, I have close friends reading it right now who are saying that they feel like they're reading my personal diary that I've stored away in my in my uh, nightstand for years. It's really a testament to um, all of these adventures I've lived and how it's honestly changed my life. Has finding love for yourself been hard, ironically hard, because you're so busy working and building this business, Bridesmaid for Hire, which is all around love? Definitely. You know, I think this business has also changed my view on love and um, has broken down that fairy tale concept we have and has made me see it in a very more realistic light. And I think because of that, um, you know, I really changed what I'm looking for in people, uh, in a person that I want to be with. And, um, you know, it's changed the way that I love myself, too. It has kind of a double meaning because starting your own business, you have to figure out something called balance. And um, I can't personally, you know, honestly say I figured that out. I tend to work more than a person should, you know, and um, I don't have much of a social life because I try to give everything I have to my career and my business. Um, So I think that finding love aspect is really about, you know, finding a relationship and also about um, finding love for myself and being able to treat myself in a nice way, even when starting a business. I've talked to so many women who have said entrepreneurship is such a journey in personal development. It is. I don't think you get this through anything else. I've had some crazy weird jobs in my life and um, none of it has been a true test of character as much as starting your own business is. Talk to us about the journey of getting your book published. I saw your video where you shared really an emotional moment about getting the first copy and you talked about the journey for you to get there. Share that a little bit with our audience. It's been just a crazy journey trying to get a book published. Um, You know, it it truly has been my dream since I was six years old. I flocked to bookstores and I loved books and I always wanted to write a book. Even at six years old, I I knew that. And it has been anything but an easy journey. Um, I've been rejected many times from publishers in the past for book ideas. And writing nonfiction is especially hard because they're not just buying you and the writing. They're buying your platform. And a couple years ago, I was turned away by many publishers who said they loved my writing, but because I didn't have 10,000 Twitter followers. And I never realized that as a writer, you also have to have this social media presence. Um, You almost have to be a celebrity to publish nonfiction. And it shouldn't be like that. Yeah, has changed so much. It has, and it shouldn't be like that. And, um, you know, it was very hard facing rejection over and over again. And, um, you know, even when selling this book, it was rejected many times before finally there was an offer. And um, it was a very emotional journey last week, getting the final copy in the mail, because I've I've honestly waited for this moment since I was six, and I'm 28 now. And um, that's a lot of years, and it was a lot of hard work. And um, why it's so emotional is because there are so many times in my journey where I should have have quit. I should have given up. I should have listened to other people. I should have chosen something else to do with my life. And I really should not have been where I am today because I really should have listened to them, but I didn't. And that's why I think it's so emotional because it's almost a testament to myself and everybody else out there. What happens if you don't give up and you don't listen to people who try to stop you? What did getting your book published teach you about personally not giving up? It taught me that you're definitely going to get so many no's before you get a yes. And my mom was the person who would tell me that all the time. She would tell me, Jen, it only takes one yes. So when you're getting literally 30 no's, 35 no's, 40 no's, that's okay because you only need one person to say yes. And it's the same thing I found with love and dating. You know, sometimes we fall in love with people who don't fall in love with us. That's Mm. happened to me many times before. And we're heartbroken. We're crushed. And it does only take one person to understand us. We just need that one person. So it's okay to let go of those people who don't because we only need to find one. And oftentimes we have to go through the no's to get the yes. And to be honest, you know, I'm hap- I am I look back at my journey and I'm so thankful for some of the no's that I got two or three years ago. Because if they would have said yes and it would have been that easy, I don't think I would be where I am today. I don't think I would have started a business and worked so hard for this book. I think I would have, you know, gotten something so easy to, in my life and, and never really expanded it or or really understood it. What do you hope the book accomplishes, not only for you, but just in general? I really hope that it teaches people that, you know, it's okay to live um, the life of your personal dreams, whether that's a little bit different or funky or, um, you know, out of the box. And, And when you do, when you do decide to truly be yourself, 
don't ever give up on yourself. Um, many people are going to try to stop you. Uh, they're going to tell you that you shouldn't, you couldn't, and you won't. And I hope when they do, you just look at them and you laugh because you will. I promise, promise, promise you that you will. What does your support network look like? I know um, it's interesting. One of the things you mentioned most recently with the book coming out, it was your mom who talked about pushing through that rejection. And then when you were younger, getting the feedback from the teacher, your mom is the one that's like, it doesn't matter, keep going. So what does your support network overall look like? And is your mom a big part of that? She is. I would say that, you know, she is definitely my number one champion. Um, She has always, always been there for me, even though I don't know why she would believe in me when I was a young girl trying to be a writer. Um, I I don't know why she always had so much faith that I would do it. I, I don't know how she can predict the future like she did. I just think that um, she saw my strength and she knew that I would never give up. But to be honest, the person who has supported me the most and influenced me the most in the past couple of years is somebody who might sound crazy to think, but um, it's my 86-year-old business tutor um, who I met because I Googled free business advice in New York City, and the lovely city of New York paired me with this man. He's a retired 86-year-old um, And at first I went to meet him and he uh, changed my whole life. He taught me about how to start a business. And what he really taught me that I'll never forget is to get over the fear of failure. Uh, He said something to me that will stick with me forever is that regret makes you human. You know, we all don't do things all of the time and that makes us human, but failure makes you a hero. When you do something and you fail or you do something and you don't get it, it makes you a hero because you tried. Uh, so what I do with my 86 year old best friend is we spend Saturday mornings together and I have to present him with ways I failed that week. Uh, so he, he encourages me to fail, which is something that nobody else in my life has ever done. You know, most people hide failures. They mask them. He makes me openly talk about them, which makes me during the week, try to live up to that and fail more often. That's amazing. And this is someone that you found online when you were searching for a business coach. I do. The city of New York has um, a program where they have retired people who are now trying to mentor younger entrepreneurs. And uh, I reached out to them. They matched me with this man named Ray. Uh, This is about two years ago. And you're supposed to go maybe once, maybe twice max. I (laughs) fully take Mm -hmm. advantage and go every single week. And um, Ray's become my my honest, my best friend. He knows everything about my life. uh, And I go to him because he's a straight shooter. He tells it like it is. Um, And I write a whole chapter in my book about him because our first meeting didn't go so well. He actually told me to leave his office. He never wanted to see me again. (laughs) He he thought that I was um, too much like a Miss America and not enough like a CEO. Uh, And I didn't leave. He told me to leave. I didn't leave. And I tried to prove myself to him. And the chapter (laughs) goes into the funny things he said and um, how I cried a little and uh, how at the end he emailed me asking to see me again because he was impressed. So um, I think he just wanted to, to really see how strong of a person I was. And he really tested me. And um, he's been my support system, which sounds so weird because it couldn't be more of a different person than I am, which leads me to believe that sometimes in your support network, you need people who are so different than you because they bring perspective you don't have from anybody else. Wow, that's powerful. I love that. I can't wait to read that story. That sounds great. I love that. Now, what's the uh, organization that you mentioned in New York or the department that connects newer entrepreneurs with these experienced people? It's called SCORE, S-C-O-R-E, and I believe they have it in other cities across the country. I think major cities, I think Boston has it, D.C. might have it, um, but it's called SCORE NYC, and it's completely free. They have business tutors and mentors in all different areas. They also have financial experts and legal experts to talk to as well, and it's free. Okay, great. I'll look it up, and I'll make sure we link to it. So what would you say entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself as a woman? I think it's taught me that I need to be on my A game um, when I'm speaking to other people and not doubt myself. I think that at first I was very wishy-washy in my emails. I said sorry a lot. I felt like I was bothering people. Um, But it really made me become a tougher person, uh, somebody who really knows how to negotiate a little bit better, Mm -hmm. um, and somebody who knows before they walk into a room I have to have full confidence and believe in myself because if not – No one will be fooled and they won't believe in me. Uh, You know, what's so crazy is that in our lives, we're never taught how to negotiate. We're never taught how to really walk into a room and consume other people with our knowledge and who we are. And I think that's a shame because many women 
they go through life not knowing how to do that. And they give in too quickly and they just take the first offer um, because no one really teaches us how to how to experience that. And I think I had to learn it the hard way. I think I had to learn it by getting walked over a couple times and entering rooms with, um, you know, men only and having to really hold my ground, Mm -hmm. uh, which was a whole learning experience in itself. Do you feel like you learned by doing, I always say learning in action as opposed to sitting and waiting until you felt confident enough or sitting and waiting until you uh, weren't the only woman in the room kind of thing? Did you feel like you sort of did it afraid? I think you have to. I am such a big firm believer in doing things when you're scared out of your mind and when you're not ready. I don't think I ever would have been ready to represent myself in a room full of men or I don't think I'd be ready to do half of the things I do on a daily basis. But I wake up and I say to myself, let's try it out. Um, that's the whole purpose of failing and being able to talk about those failures is that you're never ready and you go in there with fear and you learn as you go, you revise as you go. Uh, and I think that's just the best way to do it. Reading textbooks on these things or blog posts, they only get you so far. You really have to go out there and try. Right. Excellent. Now in closing, and this is a question, I, I won't presume that I know the answer, but you sort of gave us a hint of at least one person. But if you think over your life and career, and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be? And what would you say? I know it's going to sound super repetitive, but I have to say my mom and you know, it's just the truth that she has taught me lessons that I'm so thankful to learn. Every time I called her and said, oh, yeah, I'm not going to try this or I know I don't think I'll get this. She won't even let me finish my sentence. You know, she is the epitome of a strong woman. You see her walk into a room and you don't mess with her. You listen to what she has to say. She has that New York attitude with a Florida charm to her. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she has really made me learn that there are no excuses. If you want to do something, you have to fight forward and you can't report excuses. If I go to her and say, oh, I don't think they're going to like me, she'll say, you haven't tried. Uh, And I have to thank her because I think if I didn't have her in my life, again, I I think I would have given up on myself and I don't think we'd be having this conversation. And, um, you know, I am so incredibly thankful to have a mother like her in my life. Excellent. So tell us then how we can support you. Give everyone the website you want us to go to, of course, social media, and I'll have links to everything, but anything that you want us to know about so we can support you. Sure. You can find me at jenglance.com. Find me on social media at jenglance. And you can find my new book, Always a Bridesmaid for Hire, on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Hope you enjoy the book. It's definitely um, the trenches of my personal life. And that's Jen, J-E-N-G-L-A-N-T-Z. Yes. There you go. jenglance.com. And the book comes out February 7th, but people can pre-order now, right? They can. If you pre-order it now, you'll save 44% off, and I'm all about discounts, so get it while it's cheap. Excellent. Great. Jen, you were fantastic. I knew you would be, but even better than I thought. This was really great and fun, and I'm so proud of what you're doing and the fact that you did, did it afraid, for one, and that you created something that was very unique to you and your experiences. You're an example of, for all of us of how to do that. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. Thank you for having me on the show and for doing this amazing podcast that really inspires people all over the world. Absolutely. Thank you. Also, are you about to do a podcast? I saw a post recently from you recording something for a podcast. Oh, I did one earlier today. So I had one earlier today. Yeah. Are you doing your own or you're on another one? Oh, no, I was on another one. I would would love to my own but I know how much work. Yes, (laughs) Yes. it's a lot. lot. (laughs) It is a lot. All right. Well, Thank you again. And before you go, just a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything. Whatever you do, do not give up. And please do me a favor and start right now. You will never be ready enough, good enough, wanting to do it more than you want to do it right now. So start whatever your wildest idea is. Start today and see what happens. And don't you dare give up on yourself. Excellent. Jen Glantz, thank you. Hold on just a second. Sure. All right. Thank you so much for listening to that conversation with Jen Glantz, CEO of Bridesmaid for Hire. I appreciate you listening. And look, if you'd love to hear more interviews with inspiring women entrepreneurs and you want to support the Support is Sexy podcast in continuing to produce and create and share and provide value and resources and inspiration for and about women entrepreneurs, please go to supportissexylove.com. That's support is sexy. 
L-O-V-E dot com. So you can support our I Fund Women campaign. We're raising $20,000 so we can hire some other great women entrepreneurs to support us with talent booking, social media, and podcast production. Support is sexy. That's what we're all about around here. So I'm reaching out on behalf of the podcast to ask for your support. Donate, share, tell people about it. We have just 40 days left and I want to make sure we get the money we need to continue producing at this level. Five days a week, being here for you with powerful women and great inspiration. So again, go to supportissexylove.com. That's supportissexylove.com. And now you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy. And I'll talk to you soon. Take care.